Good morning, everybody. This is City Reachers here. This is City Reachers here, and welcome to Kairos TV. This is another occasion when we have the opportunity to um, invite somebody and introduce them to you right here in the city of San Antonio. And this is City Reachers for the love of San Antonio. And we love the city, and this is exactly what we love to do. And today, we have got somebody so interesting, I know you're going to find this fascinating, David Brown. And he's the uh, founder of the Tabernacle of David here in San Antonio, Texas. And so, welcome, welcome, Thank you. David. And Thank you. obviously, I've got dear Natalie Hardy here too. She's and always. she's always here, and she helps us. So, bless the Lord, it's a good day. So, David, it's an absolute privilege to have you here today. And, uh, um, well, um, how did you get involved with doing such a thing as the House of Prayer? Um, really, it just went back to my foundation of a relationship with the Lord. In the church, my heart grew cold in early 20s, just became more of an atheist in my thinking. I didn't get there through reasoning, just lazy, apathetic guy, and uh, never saw the Lord break in. Uh, my wife and I were separated for a time, and that's when the Lord broke into my life because I began to realize I was blaming the God that I didn't believe in for all my issues. <laughs> and so then I had this subtle thought of, well, maybe I, I do believe in God because I'm sure letting them have it now. And uh, so long, long, amazing love story short, I gave my life to the Lord, and from that place, just day and night affection started rising from my heart, day and night prayer on the heels of that started rising from my heart. And so when I came across in scripture and seeing what the Lord's doing in the earth with the raising up and establishing of the house, the house of prayer, mm -hmm. it was just a no brainer. It, it made sense. And it's not uh, at the neglect of missions or kingdom work. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure we'll get into that here in a little bit, but just the day and night adoration <laughs> fueling day and night prayer absolutely made sense and it just it it's in scripture and the lord promised to raise that up in the last days and so if this is my private life mm -hmm. and i see in scripture he wants to release this globally and corporately i want to be about his business raising up incense in every place mm -hmm. when did all this happen uh this happened in the fall of 2009 okay so not so very long ago no so this october 1st here in 2019 will be my 10-year um, mm -hmm. I call it my Jesus birthday. I actually okay. get more excited about that day mm -hmm. than my real birthday. Okay. You, you know, thanks, Mom, but yes. thank God. <laughs> <laughs> this is all born again, so yeah. it's very apt to say that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is life now. <laughs> yes. Real life. Yes, yes, this is eternal life. Okay, this is, this is amazing because I guess uh, many of our viewers today have been to various houses of prayer. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've been to Kansas City with... Uh, Mike Bickle and we visited your place and I've been to other ones we had in England mm -hmm. and uh, we've also all our lives had this as the heart of our passion and mission mm -hmm. and every church we planted was uh, and Marsman used to constantly preach the tabernacle of David so mm -hmm. it's been part and parcel and I, I'm just thrilled to have you here because I believe our city needs to understand much more uh, deeply the place of a house of prayer within a city. It's a, I want to tell you, San Antonio, it's a great privilege to have a house of prayer in a city. And you, you may think, oh, it's just a few people praying, but I want to tell you that it is something supernatural. So tell, tell me from your point of view why you think a house of prayer is necessary um, why it's necessary, and I'm going to speak to the foundation of it. Mm -hmm. A lot of us, when we talk about prayer, we're like, yeah, prayer works, and prayer helps us do mm -hmm. all the stuff. Mm -hmm. And it becomes almost the secondary thing that's put off to the side once all the stuff gets rolling and the momentum's going. Mm -hmm. And then years down the road, we have you know, have this momentum, and we're working out of anointing that we got like from a 10-year-ago outpouring, and then we start getting dried up. Mm -hmm. And we never maintain the foundations mm -hmm. that we need to to make this a constant effort. And really, it's the intimacy with the Lord that fuels this. And um, I, I liken it, as Scripture does, to being a bride. I think the Lord in this, these last days are teaching, it, teaching us what it means to be a priest and a bride, combining those both for the release of His will on the earth. Mm -hmm. 
and um, I, I tell folks when I, when I teach about the bride, because it's a weird new concept, and oftentimes the enemy foreruns ideas that are biblical that the Lord is going to establish as he's uh, revealing truth line by line throughout human history. Mm -hmm. uh, right now I believe we're in a, hit, uh, a moment in history where the Lord's speaking to the church about what it means to be the bride individually and corporately. Um, and this is so, in, so important. And this is why Revelation, Revelation uses the bridal language <clears throat> is because I'm thankful that I'm a son and I have an inheritance in the house. Yeah. And I don't want to diminish that at all, but there's a reason why the book of Revelation uses the bridal language and not the son language. Mm -hmm. My wife carries an authority in my home that my sons will never have. And so when we cultivate that intimacy with the Lord, we move his heart in different ways than if we were to come as a son, if we were to come as just someone who doesn't have that intimacy. And uh, it, it's offensive to our minds sometimes because we want to look at everyone being equal and we'll pull out phrases from Ephesians like um, there, God there's, uh, what's the phrase from Ephesians when he's telling a, yeah. no. no, when no. he's talking about no. Um, no. masters mm -hmm. who lord over their slaves. Yes, yes. Bas he's no respecter of persons. persons God's yeah. no respecter of persons. So mm -hmm. the context of that being you're the CEO of the company, mm -hmm. do not mistreat your employees mm -hmm. because the same judge is the judge of both mm -hmm. of you and, mm -hmm. and there's equal playing field. But mm -hmm. there's still the sense of pressing in mm -hmm. into that intimacy that you do have access to his heart mm -hmm. in different ways. <clears throat> and if you're one that pursues that, mm -hmm. you have a whole different sway in prayer um, with the Lord and your generation and your region. Mm -hmm. And so it's important that we cultivate the intimacy to cultivate a bride in a city that can move his heart in different ways other than just like God send revival because we want to see your power God send revival because we want to justify and validate my ministry or our group of ministries like we, no we want to see your glory your son lifted up in the city and it's that bridal heart I believe that really moves him at different and levels I think David is also about love it's all about the love of God mm. in us and through us yeah and we know that Jesus came out of love he did every did everything that he did was out of love mm -hmm. and I think that that should fuel the prayer that we pray as a people of God as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. And that's why we've got to guard our hearts above all else because it's mm -hmm. easy to get in routine mm -hmm. and I'm a routine guy. It's easy to get in the routine and then months and years down the road look back and think, wait a second, I deviated for a little bit. It's mm -hmm. time to get rooted and grounded again on loving the Lord with mm -hmm. all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is why I wear this ring. I've never been to Bible school, but that's been my Bible school is the Shema, Deuteronomy 6.4 is, mm -hmm. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. You shall love him with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that is the fuel and fire for mm -hmm. everything. Amen. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you there, mm -hmm. David. But I think God is doing something new mm -hmm. and supernatural, not just here in the city, and in a few of our hearts, but I think worldwide in his body, because he's preparing his body for mm -hmm. his coming, but he's also preparing us for warfare mm -hmm. uh, in ways perhaps we as a church have never experienced before. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can see uh, the war can get very ugly. Mm -hmm. And in some places on the face of the earth, it's terrible and people are being persecuted and killed for the gospel's sake and mm -hmm. it's always happening and it's happening more and more and more. And I believe that the lovers of Jesus are the ones who become the um, glorious martyrs for oh. Jesus. Yeah. Because, and it does say in the scripture, at such a time, many will fall away. The love of many will grow cold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because and lawlessness is because abounding. Because of lawlessness is abounding. And I think, at the same time, the love of many is growing cold, but at mm. the same time, there is a company of people who are pressing into God yeah. and their love is burning hearts and becoming more and more and more. Mm -hmm. And they are so satisfied with the sheer beauty and the loveliness of the Lord. And, mm -hmm. and I think this is happening. Yeah, it, it really uh, transforms the heart into a militant warrior heart. Absolutely. That's one thing I'm really excited to see being restored to missions again. Yes. That old time militant mindset of mm. the missionary or yes. the laborer yes. even in the yes. city yeah. of I am a warrior on mission 
fulfilling my orders because I'm in love with that one on the throne. Absolutely. That's so and well that's said. the order. So mm -hmm. well said. Because if we don't have that, I mean, that's really what propels me forward is that mm -hmm. I love him so much. Mm -hmm. And I'm willing. I, Jesus said, I hate what my father hates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I feel the same way because I love my father. I love the father. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I love what he loves and I hate what he hates. Yeah. That's what the psalmist said in Psalm mm -hmm. I think 139. Yeah. And that's how I feel too. And so I do believe that love is a foundation on all of this stuff and it will produce the warriors that God is looking for. Yeah, and I'm, I'm so glad that you brought that word up because we got to recapture the biblical meaning of it even just hate again. Absolutely. <laughs> Jesus is anointed with the oil of joy beyond all of his yes. companions because yep. he loves righteousness and he hates, hates lawlessness. Yeah, that's right. And the reason he hates lawlessness is because, you quoted it, because mm -hmm. lawlessness is abounding, love is growing cold. Yes, this yes. is why we hate lawlessness, because it's killing the love. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. That's such a good point. That's a point, yeah. Mm. Um, I was just considering this whole uh, concept before you came, and I was thinking here that um, the role the house of prayer plays within the city. But mm. I was um, just saying to Natalie before you came, I feel, and I'm sure you agree, mm. that it's such an essential part of the body of Christ within the city, but it's opening the heavens. Mm. And, and I was just seeing that um, that company of people who seek the Lord mm. day and night, they open up the heavens. Yeah. And um, we need open heavens over our cities. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think there's two things really going on is God is actually looking for a place to rest. Oh, yes. And he's looking for a people that, um, I'll, I'll use the phrase, can be trusted with his glory. Yes. Oh. Um, but can actually be protected from his glory, too, is also what I mean, when he yeah. can trust us. Because so many times we ask him for the glory, the glory, the glory, and I love the glory, <laughs> but the same fire comes, the same glory comes, and depending on your disposition towards him, when he actually manifests himself fully or unveils different aspects of himself in our city, I mean, that glory is manifested in different ways if your heart's turned against him, if you're harboring secret sin, or if you're fully in love. That's why mm -hmm. I love the question in Isaiah 33, Isaiah asks, who can dwell with everlasting burnings. Yes. In other words, the fire's coming mm. and we're all going to fire. Here's the heart disposition for you to be able to enjoy the fire mm. that's coming. Mm -hmm. If not, it's gonna be a rod of discipline on you. <laughs> oh yes, wow. oh yes. Very well said, David. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm. I wanna ask a question. Um, I know you're working towards 24 seven worship mm -hmm. prayer and worship and prayer in the city. Is it even biblical, is it necessary? Yes, it, it, it is biblical, and I'll, I'll hit the biblical component of it first. A lot of people look to that word continually mm. when King David set up the tabernacle of David, <laughs> um, but it actually, that word continually is not what we look to, to look at the uh, foundations of the uh, foundations of 24-7 prayer and worship being biblical. We look in Chronicles as more of a priestly book from that perspective, and looking at how King David set up for the Temple of Solomon. Mm -hmm. And so he had 288 uh, singers that really led mm -hmm. what was going on. And then they would have, it was three or 4,000 musicians mm -hmm. from the, that were Levites living amongst the people in the land of Israel. And so twice a year for one week, people from different spots of the land would come and these 288 leaders would fulfill a 24 hour requirement during the day. And so that's where we get King David established 24-7 worship and prayer. Um, James acknowledges it. Um, Amos prophesied it before James. In uh, Amos 9-11 and then in Acts 15-16, the prophecy that the Lord was so moved by that act. Um, I ultimately believe it was King David breaking into our New Testament Melchizedek priesthood. Amen. And um, that's why the Lord put his finger on that moment in biblical history and said, in the last days, I'm going to raise this up. Mm -hmm. so that the nations can seek me. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, in Amos, he puts his finger on his Islamic stronghold that's modern-day Jordan now mm -hmm. in the land of Edom and says, I'm going to possess this land. It's the tabernacle of David's going to be so effective across the globe as incense is rising in every place mm -hmm. that I'm going to possess an Islamic stronghold. So when my people fly to the wilderness, there's a people that are ready to take care of my people mm -hmm. in the last days. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, by the way, all the nations and incense is going to rise in every place. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Yes, oh my goodness. <laughs> yes. And so when we look at Revelation, especially those trumpet judgments, um, is when I th 
I believe because of the silence in heaven that much incense <laughs> being mingled with the prayers of the saints mm -hmm. and being hurled to earth with manifestations of what we see around the throne. Um, I believe for the first time we're going to see the church with one mind, with one voice, mm -hmm. unified, mm -hmm. actually praying through revelation mm -hmm. as these things are unfolding. And when these trumpets are blasting, the judgments that are against the Antichrist empire mm -hmm. and against the Babylonian systems, it takes out one third of the earth. Mm -hmm. Like, oh man, that's a big space. But we still have, does that mean we have air superiority through a mature Melchizedek priesthood unified in a global church mm -hmm. that is able to keep two thirds of the earth protected from the judgments of the Lord in that hour? And so I'm looking forward towards the unity, the oneness of the church. Um, walking in a maturity of that level that can handle a global responsibility of prayer um, in our cities and, and all that mm. stuff. So, mm. bless the Lord. So that's a Amen. Lot. That's right. That's what well, we're seeing now. Some of this is already beginning to happen as we're seeing many and many uh, Islamic people coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus yes. Christ mm -hmm. in very supernatural ways. The Lord is manifesting himself to them to them and they are they are saying he is the one mm -hmm. we need this Jesus we need him mm -hmm. and I believe that is a part of the, the, the results of the church praying uh, and the Lord's finger as you say yeah. so wonderfully on that part of the world we want uh, those who are caught in darkness caught in this in this system that is Antichrist and um, God is doing it and so I want to see more and more of that happening and uh, is the house of prayer praying towards that specifically we are and we just are beginning to form relationship with the group laboring in the Middle East right now, Frontier Alliance International. If you've never heard of them, go, you can pull them up on YouTube, FAI, mm -hmm. and they have wonderful documentaries of what's going on in the Middle East. Frontier's their newest one. Um, they've got uh, one that gripped my heart years ago called Sheep Among Wolves. They're only about seven years old, but they're, they've been mightily impactful in the Middle East. And my wife and I just got back from a conference there in Galilee to meet some of these guys and uh, see what they're doing in the Middle mm -hmm. East. And uh, I'm just really come back fully convinced that the great harvest, the majority of it is going to be Muslims. Mm -hmm. And just like we saw in World War, World War II, there were those that could not consciously get on board with the Nazi regime. Mm -hmm. And they would hide Jews and protect Jews, mm -hmm. many of them at the expense of their own lives. Mm -hmm. And so I believe the greatest way that the Lord's bringing in fullness in the end times for the church to provoke Israel to jealousy is Muslims giving their lives to Christ that wow. will lay down their lives for Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to see that and be a part of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that I, I, I just fell in love with Muslims too while I was there. It was, yes. it was amazing and mm -hmm. seeing the Lord's plan and even how important uh, a clear understanding and articulation of end time events is in association with the gospel of Jesus in the Middle East. Because Jews, Muslims, Christians, everyone's looking for the second coming of Christ. Exactly. Yes. yes. Wow. Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear you talking about Muslims because mm. it's been a passion in my heart always. Um, since we even before we went to India, you know, we've always prayed over Islam mm. and prayed for the Silk Road. That was my initial focus of prayer. But now we pray for a ministry called SAT7, mm. S-A-T-7, which is a, a ministry into all of the Middle Eastern nations, mm. Muslim nations, of television. And they are seeing tens of thousands being reaped. Tens of thousands. Yeah. And the latest um, field is Turkey, mm. which is the smallest church on the face of the earth. And wow. they are just doing amazing things there. Tremendous opposition, always, mm. always. But God's reaping his harvest there. Yes, yes, yes he is. And mm. a lot of it, uh, I mean, <laughs> is because Islam has flourished so well in the mm. Middle East that especially in nations on, in Iran where Muslims are in government and there's a joining of their church and state, yeah. uh, many are seeing Islam unveiled and fully vented. And they don't want it. No. And so it's making people hungry for oh. Jesus. Yeah. And many are converting to Christianity. And the church <laughs> in Iran, even though the government is very oppressive, the underground church in Iran is flourishing and mm -hmm. exploding. Well, it's the biggest, it's the fastest growing church in the whole wide world. Yes. The church in Iran. Hallelujah. Yes. What you Hallelujah. said to me just, uh, just warms my heart because in, I've prayed in, in the past 
that the Lord would so open the eyes of Muslims yes. to see the horrors of Islam, to yes. see how dark it is, yes. and, and that would just cause them to reject it. Mm. And they would see the glory of God and want Him. Yeah. And what you're saying, God is answering that prayer. People are coming. They're being drawn away, mm -hmm. and they're turning their backs on the darkness. Yeah, Praise it, God. it is so cool to see. I just, man, bless the Lord. He's really smart. <laughs> He's doing all this stuff. I just get to be a part. That's right. And it's amazing. It is wonderful. <laughs> yeah. And the 1040 window mm -hmm. targeted that actual strip of land all the way through the Muslim nations. Mm -hmm. And there was those... Um, three years of continuous worldwide focused prayer called mm. the 1040 window. You may have remembered that. Oh, yes. Yes. And so I think tens of thousands all around the world were involved in that. And I think we're seeing the reaping now. We the are. 1040. And uh, there's still <coughs> ministries that are rallying prayer around that mm -hmm. um, in a more strategic nature. Um, ignite <coughs> the nations. Mm -hmm. um, or no, excuse me, inherit the nations. Mm -hmm. You can look them up on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, a, a couple in Dallas, mm -hmm. they were missionaries and haven't retired from the mi ministry, but are in more of a centralized role. And so what they're doing is yoking uh, teams that are on the ground, we're actively working with unreached peoples, mm -hmm. with houses of prayer in the states. Yes. And so I can't say who we're praying for on, online, but we've been yoked with one of the teams that are on the ground working with an unreached people group. Mm -hmm. And it's been such a pleasure to wow. develop relationship mm -hmm. and be in constant communication with them, mm -hmm. to hear their prayer needs, give them.